What's good guys, welcome back to the channel. Today we are doing another testing tutorial. This time around is insulation resistance testing, so a lot to get through. The practical is pretty simple, but the theory, well, it's just a lot uh, to insulation resistance testing, mainly uh, what can come from the readings. But regardless, we'll run through all of that, practical and theory, and hopefully give you a good insight into the test. If you just jumped on this video because you're on site and you want to know just how to get the test done, how to get that result, there'll be some timestamps below. You can skip to the practical, skip to the theory, Theory, skip to whatever and uh, yeah just use them as you see fit. Let's run the intro and get into this test process. Before we get into anything, this is a dead test, so the installation should be isolated. If you're conducting this test on a new installation, you'll actually carry this test out as part of the initial verification process, so nothing should be switched on anyway. But on an existing installation, you will need to carry out the safe isolation procedure uh, on the installation, or at least on the circuits you're working on, so that you can conduct this test. However, the test does create live conditions. You are gonna be firing a voltage through the circuit, uh, 250, 500, maybe even a thousand volts. So you do wanna be treating the environment as a live environment also. You wanna notify people within the installation as well as coworkers that you are gonna be conducting this test, the areas that it will affect and what not to touch. It's not a big deal, but yeah, volts do jolt and uh, yeah, it will give someone a nasty surprise. So although this is a dead test, you are introducing live conditions. I just wanted to uh, yeah, be clear about that because I think it's quite important. So what is this test and why do we do it? Well, simply put, the insulation resistance test involves injecting a DC test voltage dependent on the nominal voltage of the circuit and measuring the resistance of the cable insulation. This test is carried out between all live conductors and live in CPC. We do this because BS7671 requires it, but also because it makes sense. Cables are not indestructible and can easily get damaged during or after installation by anyone on site. This test proves the integrity of the insulation and checks for short circuits between conductors. Before we get into the practical steps, there's a bit of theory about this test that's important to understand before even getting the tester out. Firstly, this test may need to be carried out at multiple stages of the construction phase, as well as during initial verification, and BS7671 actually promotes this practice. With the arrival of Amendment 2 of the 18th edition of the wiring regs, it stipulates that the test voltage must match that of Table 64, regardless of the equipment installed on the circuit. And therefore, testing during the construction phase makes sense. Before second fix, you can easily fire 500 volts around the circuit before connecting any of the sensitive kit. The regs also permit that a lower test voltage of 250 volts may be used, but only if a 500 volt test has been applied prior. So what this means is during various stages of the construction phase, test it at 500 volts before anything gets second fixed, while you can easily link stuff out. And then after that, when it comes to initial verification and everything's connected you can then do it at 250 with uh, combined live and, and CPC testing and make your life a whole lot easier. It's also required that the relevant tests involving CPCs are tested with the protective conductors connected to earth. This means the earthing will need to be in place and the CPCs connected as well as any bonding and this may even require fly leads to connect stuff like SWA sheaths to the MET2. A few other important things to consider are that various accessories containing indicator lamps or capacitors may need to be disconnected to avoid inaccurate readings. You'll also want to think about sensitive equipment such as dimmers, RCDs, anything low voltage. Uh, you might want to disconnect them because uh, yeah, the test voltage could fry them. But there's also an alternative or workaround test method that you can use to uh, yeah, keep those things connected. I'll cover that later on in the video. Some devices when de-energized will also be in an open state too. So drivers, switches, smart tech, stuff like that. So you might need to bypass them, you know, connect around them so that you can test the circuit and the installation fully. You also want to be wary of electronics or transformers connected between live and neutral as these will bring values down. Certain protective devices can also have the same effect such as SPDs and some RCDs, RCBOs as well. Basically when you're going in to do an insulation resistance test you just want to assess all of the connected kit or the kit that's going to be connected and use that to judge how you navigate the testing process, what you do and don't do and uh, yeah how much extra work's involved to get those results. 
The incoming neutral will also need to be isolated or disconnected where necessary so that there is no connection to earth. This must be done so safely though. If the installation is not fully isolated, the neutral can become live if that link is removed. You don't want that floating at 2.30. <laughs> it's really, really dangerous. But yeah, just, just do it safely when uh, disconnecting the neutral. Now that that's all out of the way, let's talk about the specifics of the test itself and how to conduct it. And then I promise we'll get into the actual process after all of this waffle. The test itself should be carried out with the main switch off, all fuses in place, lamps removed and stuff like fluorescence or other loads ideally disconnected. Obviously we all live in the real world and sometimes it may be impractical to remove all lamps and disconnect all loads. The regs and the guidance notes are quite forgiving in this respect and they do understand this. So what it says is that if it isn't possible and it is really impractical, think about a massive installation or where it's going to do more damage than good i.e. you're dismantling more of the circuit than you're testing, then you can leave stuff like local switches and isolators off and therefore the kit that they're serving won't be included in the test and uh, yeah, it will allow you to get a clean, uninfluenced result. This uh, allowance shouldn't, however, be abused and you should just use it wisely and where needed. If there are lighting contactors or specialist dimming controls, all of the conductors, including switch lines, will also need to be tested, so you might need to link some stuff out there as well. Results-wise, you're actually looking for the highest value possible, usually greater than the range of the tester, but a result as low as one mega ohm complies with the requirements of the regs. However, on a brand new installation or a brand new circuit, a value below 20 mega ohms should be investigated. Right, I get it, shut up Mike and tell me how to do this test. For this explanation, we're going to assume the circuit has a nominal voltage of 250 volts, but it's been tested during the construction phase at 500 volts and now I'm doing my initial verification. I'm going to get my MFT or my insulation resistance tester out and set it to the insulation resistance mode and set the test voltage to 250 volts. Before getting stuck in, I'm going to connect my leads together and press test. A dead short should appear, 0.00, .00 on the screen. I'll then take them apart and press test again. The resistance should then be greater than the range of the tester. This not only confirms your leads are good, but if you're using a tester you're not familiar with, it will also let you know the range and the limitations of that test voltage. The first way to test is what they call a global IR. Following the theory set out before, you conduct this test on a whole consumer unit. The test voltage will be applied between line and neutral, neutral and CPC, and line and CPC. Again, with the CPC connected to the main earthing and all bonding conductors connected. The second method is testing the circuits individually. This is exactly the same as before, but on the circuit itself. So line to neutral, neutral to CPC, and line to CPC. With both of these methods, you're again looking for a value no lower than one mega ohm, and on a new install, of course, you'd want to investigate anything below 20 mega ohm. When it comes to recording results, the value of the line and neutral test will of course be recorded in the live live column. However, when it comes to the live earth column, there's a few different ways it can go down. If you tested line and neutral combined to earth, then that will be your result in the, in the live to earth column. However, if you tested line to earth and then neutral to earth, you'll actually pick the lowest result of the two because that's going to be the worst result and record that in that column. On a three phase circuit or installation, you would test between all phase combinations, so L1 to L2, L1 to L3, L2 to L3, and then test between all phases connected together and neutral. Out of all of these four combinations, the lowest reading would be your live to live value and get recorded in that column. You would then connect all of the live conductors together, L1, L2, L3, and neutral, connect them all together and test between them and earth, and this will give you your live to earth value and of course this will get recorded in the live to earth column. When using test method one, the global IR test on complex installations, you may get a low value. This is because more cable length creates a lower overall insulation resistance. And in this case, you should just subdivide the insulation into its component parts so that you can carry out the test reliably. 
With both of these methods, it's important that stuff like two-way switching is operated and tested to verify the full extent of the wiring. So all combinations, you're basically making sure that the test voltages are applied to every single strapper, every single bit of the circuit. And also with both of these test methods, if there is sensitive equipment vulnerable to the test voltage, you can test the line and neutral conductors together with the CPC. So you would literally connect line and neutral, connect them together, and then test between that combined sort of core that combined live with CPC. This method means that there is no potential difference between line and neutral on connected devices and means that they can't be damaged by the high voltage. Again, you must ensure that the CPC is connected to the earth and the origin for this method. There we have it. That is it, insulation resistance testing. Hopefully you've learned something. Um, hopefully this video has helped. The best advice I can give is just get out there and test, to be honest. Uh, insulation resistance testing is quite complex out in the field. It's easy to yeah, read the book and now to do it. But when I first went out there thinking I knew how to test, uh, I'd get tripped up all the time by insulation resistance testing. So yeah, make sure you get lots of experience in on it. And uh, yeah, just understand the circuit that you're testing because the test itself is easy but the amount of things that can affect and influence the test uh, yeah are vast you're, you're rarely testing a pure circuit you know it's refreshing when you are but you rarely are insulation resistance testing is actually my favorite tool when fault finding as well it gives you so much information when you know how to yeah, decipher the values in fault sort of scenarios so yeah it's a really good test to just learn and hone um, because it can really help you out like I've said already hopefully you've learned something hopefully you've enjoyed this video it's not as exciting as being out on the tools being on site but i enjoy making them and hopefully they help uh, at least one person anyway that's all that matters thanks for watching i'll catch you on the next one